I'm Bunny Rubin, and I'm very honored to open up this session and to act as the moderator of this session. I thank all those who have arrived. And by coming, you are in fact expressing a desire to listen, to be attentive, and maybe to help somehow uh, with contending, uh, contending with a problem um, which is extremely significant. The archaeology of Jerusalem is very complex. It's very complex as any uh, as an um, area of study. Whoever tried to study Jerusalem knows this. It is complex because it is a direct derivative of archaeology, is a preservation of archaeology and uh, developing tourism, developing a heritage. And all these issues are complex issues, and not even not necessarily in Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem, they are much more complex because they touch upon something so sensitive, almost an open wound, a scar of sorts. Um, you can um, use any metaphor you will because it is a, a city in, in, in conflict. It is a, a holy city. It's a sacred city. It is the city of three religions. And it, it's also a very, let's say the word varied, just as an understatement. It's a varied city. It's, it's much more than just varied. Again, it's in conflict, as I said. And when we talk about preservation and development of heritage, um, it is always accompanied by um, a question mark. Whose heritage? Who is preserving whose heritage? And how does he go about doing so? Throughout the past year, uh, the initiative of MX Chavez um, established a team, archaeologists, archaeologist, uh, preservers, people from urban planning, people from tourism, and they formed this team that tried to come up with a paper, which would be very general, a paper of principles um, in preparation of some sort of uh, action plan that would be based on professional principles. And not only, you know, who's pulling the rope and who's pressurizing who. And the paper that was formed would be will be presented by Professor Rafi Greenberg from the archaeology and um, Eastern um, cultures from the Far East, from in Tel Aviv University. We have three responses: Mrs. Ilanit Malkior, who is responsible for tourism and the authority for the development of Jerusalem, and she'll have to leave when she's done, and she apologizes. Is she here, Mrs. Malkior? We don't know each other. Okay, Mr. Tamir Nir who holds a portfolio of um, protecting uh, sites in Jerusalem, and Professor Aaron um, David from the University of South uh, California. Unfortunately, Mr. Israel Hassan, who is the Director General of the Antiquities Authority, um, canceled um, his appearance two days ago. and. It's actually, I, I, I wonder at the fact that he wasn't able to send other people from the Antiquities Authority because there are quite a few people there who do deal with preservation and protection in Jerusalem. And I wonder at it. And there are some other people with authority that would be able to talk to us about these things and who understand matters. So Professor Rafi Greenberg, please. Okay, thank you and good evening. I will talk about uh, this uh, paper that you all received when you walked in, which is called the Principles Paper direct Directives uh, for the Preservation of Jerusalem and how to manage the antiquities of Jerusalem, basically. And I will present, in short, what the dynamics uh, of, uh, of this paper uh, were and what the main principles of this paper are. And at the end of the session, we'll be able to answer some questions from the audience that will um, maybe raise matters that I won't be able to have time to raise now. I don't have much time. So as was said already, uh, this, again, this uh, position paper sort of includes all sorts of principles and, and it was uh, written by a team of different people. As was mentioned, there were 14 participants that participated in the discussions uh, on this topic, seven women and seven men, all of them Israeli. 
So what we see here represents a work of a professional team, and it does not include professionals that are non-Israeli, whether if it's international uh, professionals or Palestinian professionals, we can relate to that later on. Let me just say that we did invite, and it was an open invitation, we, we, it was an open call to, to people, but I guess these are the people that uh, were interested enough to impact Israeli policy in Jerusalem. I don't think there is any particular problem with it, but we can talk about it later on and come back to it. The main object objectives that we wrote before us or that basically united or unified all those that participated in those meetings were, of course, um, preserv preserving the heritage uh, of Jerusalem, the history of Jerusalem, with a great focus on the fact that these are th resources that are not renewable. They are limited. We cannot renew them. And they are wearing and tearing. There is erosion. And that is why we are obligated to think how we can preserve them and what our role is in, preser in pre preserving them so that the generation, the next generation will have what to look at. And it also obligates us to be humble because Jerusalem has no much significance without its past. And that part of that is still built, that is still around, is very important. And we are not here forever. New people will come after us new communities, and they will ask themselves the questions, you know, what did these people do? What did those before us do? How did they work? What did they leave for us? What did they destroy? What did they preserve? And that is why we have to think, what are we leaving? I'm already the second generation of those uh, excavating Jerusalem. And um, we've seen, again, that there were great excavations that have no inheritors and uh, huge areas that nobody visits. And the second thing that we place on the people were identifying the stakeholders in that, um, that, that build up part, managing that heritage of those areas, meaning, and, and for who are we preserving? Who are we preserving? For whom? That knowledge, that, that heritage of the, the built parts those tangible things that have remained. Who are the people? Who are the bodies? And I think we have identified these, and maybe this is what, uh, again, makes this a joint interest. We did identify common objective among the various communities of the city, different bodies in the city. And, uh, th of course, there are people that have power and leaders that exploit antiquities, whether it's governments, uh, religious institutes, or whether if these are affluent people or entrepreneurs. And do we have to place the professionals um, you know, I around the table and think what is good for the Jerusalem, its inhabitants, for those who respect it? And only later on to think what would be good for those with different interests, uh, for tourism, for people with capital. And the third point is transparency. Transparency of all the, the processes, both of demolition and preservation. Uh, archaeology is always a process of demolition, of destruction, of ruin, and preservation. And we would like to shed light on what we are doing, and that is part of our recommendation as well. Just in a nutshell, the basis for the discussion, what did we take into account? What did we bring with us? What is, uh, which load is each one bringing with him? And what did we work with? First of all, we looked with the b basic principles, professional principles, ethical principles. All those who participated are professionals from different areas with many years of experience. And we brought all of those to the table, again, from the professional time and from the ethical side. We wanted there to be professional etiquette and ethics 
um, we of course took into account the administrative system, the legal system, international convention, uh, best practices, meaning what would be the best thing to do, what is considered around the world to be the best way to act, best practices. And of course, we took into account the situation in the field, what is actually taking place. I would like to mention what we did not take into account. Of course, we took into account uh, the weather um, and things like that, but we did not take into account various future political scenarios. This was never a political discussion. We never asked what will be if Jerusalem would be divided, if there will be Israeli sovereignty, Palestinian sovereignty, international uh, rule, whatever it may be. We did not talk of that. So we think that our recommendations um, are true of any political scenario. And we did not, again, take into account various contemporary uh, borders, uh, jurisdictions, uh, who is responsible for this area. Is it the municipality? Is the Antiquities Authority? Um, whatever body it may be. We did have a sense of urgency because we use the current laws today in a way that as far as we are concerned actually wear and tear the antiquities the treasures of jerusalem and erodes them and we felt that these laws are taking them in the wrong direction that is why our proposals are the proposals that go beyond the law of course there is law we can abide by the law every place has its law and everything's okay legally speaking we have ne we don't claim that something illegal has been done but we s are saying that the law enables antiquities to be harmed and undermined. How could this be? How could the antiquities law allow antiquities to be undermined and damaged and ruined? So in the antiquities law, uh, the, the, let me explain as follows. A certain um, interpretation of this law actually allows, again, uh, by the official, antiquities official authority to demolish, to build without a pl a planning process by means of the tools that is the tool that is called author authorization to excavate, which is sometimes it's called uh, preservation, following excavation, during excavation, and this official can do s as he wills by law, and again, um, as, f as and again in accordance or according to the desire and will of the entrepreneurs. They can be private entrepreneurs, governmental entrepreneurs. There is no external supervision beyond what is happens in the Antiquities Authority, and there is no transparency to the um, public at large. Let me give you a few examples so that you'll be able to see what we are talking about. The, the official, the, the head of the authority, the uh, excavation authority d can decide to excavate in any area where there he, th he feels there is a need. He doesn't have to consult anybody with regards to the excavation. For example, in this particular place that you see, it is the Givati uh, parking lot. A, a whole pit was excavated, was dug out. And we are talking about, again, this is uh, for, for foundations for a building. That's the purpose of the excavations or the... Uh, in Jerusalem, we see them every all these huge pits in the center of town. These, there's a cedar pit, uh, the side of pit. This is the Givati uh, excavation, and we know we are talking about an excavation for the purpose of building. The fact that there are all these antiquities at the bottom does not turn into archaeological digging or excavation, but it's enough to 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 excavate. So they started building this building, which is the famous Kedem building, of course. But the fact that they started digging out for the foundation, it was all done with the authorization. No planning process was done beforehand, by the way. So this is something that happened, and it ended. The plans were approved. And this is what's happening. This is not the underground train in Tel Aviv, which does not yet exist. Uh, this is actually some sort of an underground pathway that nobody knows about its existence, or few know about its existence. It actually goes under the main uh, um, road of Wadi Chilve between the uh, Shiloach Pool to the Givati Parkway, all the way to the Davidson Center. So we're talking about a tunnel, you can see it, that includes a lot of concrete, a lot of steel, and it will create some sort of a sleeve of concrete and it will go actually will actually be built about a Roman road uh, of yore and 
people will be able to go th uh, walk there. Could you imagine the environmental um, impact when it comes to all the drilling? Uh, it's very significant. You didn't hear about it because it was all done under the homes of very poor people, Jews, Palestinians that have no voice. But this is what these homes look like, or at least some of them that actually are exist there above this tunnel. So they are building this tunnel. They pour um, hundreds of tons of, of uh, concrete, of steel, and there's no building plan, there's no permit, there's no request for building permit, nothing. It's all done by authorization, authorization for excavation. Also in preservation, you can do wonderful things, by the way. And here, this is again, this is um, spaces um, under the Western Wall Tunnels. And I love this, the, this term, utilization of spaces. Um, it can go in different direction than how it's utilized. But again, you see, this is even toilets that were built. And of, uh, of course, you can see the beautiful lighting uh, that was done here. And uh, in terms of architecture, uh, how thoughtful it was and how to turn this sort of space, this sort of pit, which is very ancient. I'm sure it, it, uh, it has, this wasn't the original purpose of the space, that's for sure. But even if it's less blatant, uh, here, this is a sort of a conference center or, or for prayers. I'm not sure. This is under the um, Ohel Yitzchak, the Isaac tent, some under private homes, some under um, the Western Wall area. They took different spaces. They joined them together, and they turned them into something that they weren't originally. Now, this happens only because of, uh, because of private bodies or, or uh, activities done by the Antiquities Authority. So again, using uh, the term, uh, the utilization of spaces, of course, it can be taken up by different bodies, could be religious bodies or otherwise. And of course, antiquities are just thrown out um, as this is happening and this, the damage is irreversible. Now, basic uh, recommendations are as follows. That an excavation, which is a preparation for building. I'm just cutting it short because you have it all before you. There are actually three different documents. There is a full document that we did not give you. There is a, a summary of the document that you have before you, and in the everything in the su everything is in the summary. Just that the the, the bigger paper is just uh, just more elaborated. And, and here's a paper that, or the document that I prepared, which is just bullets, and I will expand on them. So again, excavation, which is preparation for building, will be considered as part of the a building plan, which is beyond what is required in the antiquities law. We want that in Jerusalem there will be a special situation that if somebody is going to excavate some sort of a pit for the purpose of building this excavation, this pit will not be referred to as a regular excavation for building, but it's part of a plan. And then it has to be approved. It has to receive a permit, just like it's as part of any building process. And we'd like that uh, excavations of preservation and development will look at the overall picture, not only locally, and, and that not every um, building will, will be just looked at in a very limited fashion, but that there will be an overall perspective, the ancient Jerusalem. I uh, actually maybe had to say this before, that the space we are talking about, the area we are talking about, again, that, that holy basin from the Mount of Olives in the east to Mamila in the west, from the tombs of the kings in the north all the way to the Shiloh pool in the south. So we are talking about that, the, the entire area. And these processes, again, will be subject, both excavation and the preservation, again, will be subject to public processes, as is the custom in any uh, building process. It will require an excavation license. I said that authorization that we have today is just as far, you know, what the, the manager says. and. This would now require, again, a licensing team that will not be part of the Antiquities uh, Authority. So it actually takes the excavation and places it outside of the Antiquities Authority. That so that the authority doesn't decide on its own. There will be, um, again, coordination with UNESCO because the old city is defined as uh, one of a uh, uh, UNESCO uh, endangered site with, again, with a value, uh, 
which is uh, at risk and of uh, a value in terms of heritage. So any excavation in Jerusalem has to be coordinated with UNESCO. I will cut this short. There will be complete separation between the regulator, meaning the Antiquities Authority and the executive body, with, so there won't be conflict of interest. Dismantling of any remnants is part of preservation because I said that any excavation is demolition and preservation has to be part of a preservation process. It won't just be um, in accordance with what the official decides. And of course, the things would have to, we have to try preserve and uh, turn uh, turn the area into what it was as much as possible. We have to have the participation of the community. People have to be part of any process of excavation. People from the community wi when we are excavating different spaces so that people will not feel that people are just digging under their homes, trying to preserve the original character of the place. This relates to what I said of that utilization of spaces that I used before. There are certain appropriate ways to utilize spaces and some others that are in inappropriate. And we talk about the different cultural communities in Jerusalem. They have to be a factor. It has to be, they have to be an integral part of this preservation process and displaying their antiquities. We want to hear multiple voices of all the existing cultures that exist today or that did exist in the past in Jerusalem. So let me just add just another word, if I may, because my time is almost up. I'm sure you you know you think what kind of authority does such a team have? Who 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 decided that you can decide? Um, so again, nobody appointed us. It's a civil team of civilians, and we have come again with the authority that we have as professionals, and because we were able to create a discussion, and a debate, and to get um, some sort of feedback from the community, from the from our colleagues. That is why it is so important for us that the head of the Antiquities Authority uh, come and talk to us. I would be happy to hear the opinion of the Antiquities Authority in light of what we have said, because I'm sure the Antiquities Authority doesn't see matters as we see matters. So thank you so much, and I'll be very happy to answer questions at the end of the session.